Hi, this is Bobby Kimber, and again, welcome to Off the Cuffs. Very excited today to have with me Congressman Bud. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks Great for stopping here. by. Yeah, thank you. It's a real honor. It's good to uh, meet you a few weeks ago. Yeah. Thanks for uh, for reconnecting. Sounds like we've got some great family connections. Yeah, we do. We, you know, we got to talk about that in a minute. But uh, normally, what we do when we have guests here, tell us about you. You know, I, I know who you are. Uh, know some of your family members. Mm-hmm. But tell us, you know, to the people that don't know who you are, tell us who you are and how did how did you get in. Uh, to be the congressman from uh, North Carolina. Yeah. So how long is the podcast, right? So listen, you got plenty of time. <laughs> no. Listen, we, you got plenty of time. Sure. So born in Winston Salem, uh, first home right off there, of Robin Hood Road. When I was four or five years old, uh, and go back before that, I was born at Baptist Hospital. Yeah. And uh, I think they stopped delivering babies shortly after that, um, and then started over at Forsyth. But yeah, I was one of the Baptist babies, and yeah. restarted recently, I believe. So uh, a couple of years old, four or five years old, my parents moved out to Davie County, bought a farm out there, and uh, decided to raise me and my two older brothers in Davie County, wow. uh, right on the Yadkin River. So we grew up living uh, kind of this uh, rural farm life, a lot of hard work out there, uh, cattle, chicken, kind of grew uh, into a real farming operation. But my dad had a business in town that he had started. Actually, the, the doctor that delivered me and my two older brothers, Dr. Joseph May, he was an OBGYN professor at uh, Wake Forest uh, Medical mm-hmm. School. Um, and my dad, I had looked to him as a mentor and as a, you know, he was a physician and a family friend, yeah. delivered me, my two older brothers, and he helped my dad get started um, after college in a little janitorial business right over where uh, the Benton Convention Center is. It's no longer there. They, they yeah. tore it down years later and built the Benton. And um, uh, so we had a janitorial supply company. And that's kind of where it all started in North Carolina for us after High Point University for my dad. And so we had this business uh, here in town that we would either do, I would deliver supplies or I would scrub floors at Baptist Hospital, R.J. Reynolds, and do that type of work. Uh, and then there was landscaping that kind of grew out of that. Right. And so I would either do that janitorial or I'd push mowers or weed eating um, or just whatever kind of work they needed, or I would do farm work. So that's kind of how I grew up. And then Davie County High School um, and then uh, from there, Appalachian State and seminary afterwards. And Mar- the seminary school? Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. See, I didn't know that. Now, see, I read yeah. up on you, and I didn't see that part. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's more than uh, there was more to me than Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, my wife and I both went. We I met my wife in Moscow. Really? Absolutely. But they asked how her English is. It's really good. She's from West Virginia, so she got good English. But <laughs> but yeah, we've been married uh, this week twenty six years, and uh, we got three kids. Um, came into office in twenty sixteen. I'd never run for office before. Okay. Um, and, you know, it just had a heart of service. My dad would take me to to meet a lot of city leaders here in Winston. Also, of course, we lived kind of business in Winston, yeah. farm in Davie County. So I got to know leaders at the county level, local level. Sometimes they would come through, um, it'd be a fundraiser in town, he'd take me along and get to meet people, run for governor, uh, senate, different things. So I got to see it, but I always thought maybe you know one day after kids were out of the house, I would run for office. Uh, but it wasn't like an ambition or aspiration. It was something I just, um, I saw it as a means of service. And uh, that's kind of, you know, the, the family's business name for years was called Bud Services. People still call it that. It's the but, Bud Group, right? Yeah, it is now. It's since 96, uh, I believe it's had that name. But it was North State Supply early on. Right. And Weaver Maintenance before that, when it was in where Benton Convention Center is. That was before I was even born. So, you know, you and I were talking offline before we actually got started. Yeah. And I was sharing with you that uh, Ken Bud uh, went to Pfeiffer with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was down at Pfeiffer with me. And I didn't make the connection until later on that uh, you all were related. First and, cousins. Yeah. yeah. He was from Jersey, right? That's right. He's from South Jersey. Yeah. They're very different than North Jersey, which is more like New York. So it's the Garden State because it's an ag state. So he grew up in a family that does potato and onion distribution. Exactly. And so he had that ag. That's probably what made my dad attracted to the farm life uh, here in North Carolina as well. Because uh, he had that ag background from southern New Jersey. Okay. But it really goes back to even before my dad. It goes back to Ken's dad, which is why I'm a North Carolinian. And that's Dave Budd. Uh, so in 1957, now, you know, we look at Wake Forest University here in town. Right. But some people get confused with Wake Forest, the city, right. north of Raleigh. Mm-hmm. Well, in 1957, you know, R.J. Reynolds here 
was booming. And they said, well, we need a world-class university here in Winston-Salem, which is growing. So they essentially moved Wake Forest University from the town of Wake Forest here to Winston, built a new campus, largely funded it. Um, but they recruited a basketball team. And so I guess and they looked at Dave Budd in Woodbury, New Jersey, right across from Philadelphia. And they recruited him down to play starting in 1957, 1956 excuse me, under Bones McKinney. And who was the the first basketball coach here in Winston Salem for Wake? He became a sports announcer later on, right? I believe he did. Yeah, yeah. Still before my time. Yeah. I was born in seventy one. So young man, young man. My uh, uh, my dad followed his older brother down. He would come down from Jersey in high school and watch him play basketball, and then uh, fell in love with High Point University and came here. And then the team, one of the friends of the team of Wake Forest, was that Dr. Joseph May, okay. who ended up being the doctor that delivered me and my two older brothers. Wow. Yeah. So uh, Dave went on, I'll just mention uh, him, he became famous or infamous because he went on to play for the New York Knicks. He went back to New Jersey, New York, played for the Knicks, and became really famous in 1962 when he guarded Wilt Chamberlain the night he scored 100 points. <laughs> so you could, yeah. when you see Ken Bud, you can ask him about that. Dave's, he's just now turned 80 years old. He's, um, you know, That's he's Ken's, great, dad. Ken's dad. Yeah. Wow. Uh, great, great guy and, uh, you know, wonderful uncle. I see. I didn't know that part of the yeah. Bud family. Yeah. yeah he probably, a, he's probably still a sore subject in 1979. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't know, yeah. 1979, <laughs> we got to fight for now. He didn't, he didn't share that with yeah, us. Yeah. 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 But I knew he was from upstate somewhere, though. That's right. We always talked about that. And uh, I remember him being a wrestler. He was down there on a wrestling scholarship, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, yeah, I, re- I remember that. So tell me, what's it like? What's it like being a congressman? What's it like being in D.C.? What's that like? Well, it it really depends. You know, we're we're in D.C. about 90 nights a year, 95 nights a year. Okay. Uh, and the rest of it, we're here in district. We're working. We have an office. Um, I've got an office office in Guilford County. I've got an office in Davie County, and I, I represent five counties. So what, if you five, take, what five counties you represent? So I've got, I go, the district goes from Greensboro all the way down to Iredell County. Okay. So Davie, Iredell, Rowan, uh, Guilford, and Davidson counties. And But it's getting ready to change. So it's going, and the population is always the same for uh-huh. U.S. Congress. So for U.S. Senate, it's always two per state. It doesn't matter if you're Rhode Island, tiny little state, big state like Montana, it's always two. But if the U.S. House, it's always population. And you take the U.S. population just rough math, you know, 320 million people, and you divide it by 435 members of Congress. Right. And you end up with about 735,000 people. So every congressional district, now if that's in New York City, I mean, you can walk that in an afternoon, right? Because it's all packed together. Right. Um, it, you know, a, a district around Charlotte is really packed, but mine spreads out because it's got more rural area. Right. Um, you know, in Greensboro, it's like half the population that I represent of the 735,000 is half of Guilford County and the rest of it is the four other counties that I represent but all rural it's getting ready to change because of the court order and now it's going to 10 counties to 10 counties it'll go from 10 it'll go to 10 parts of 10 counties yeah all the way out to the Virginia border up to the Virginia border and uh, you know we're getting to learn the new district but what's the new district going to look like uh, well, it looks kind of like, uh, I guess my kids say it looks like the Star Wars AT-AT right now, uh-huh. the little walking thing. Yeah. You know, that, uh, but now it's going to look like a kneeling camel. So I don't know if that's what you mean, what it looks like, but yeah, it's well, got all these shapes. Well, well, so what other counties will it encompass? It'll go all the way up to Person and Caswell wow. County. Yeah. So all the way to the Virginia border. Uh, and then it'll still keep Rowan, but I won't have Iredell anymore. Still have Davidson County. And look, uh, I'll have you'll have a new representative right here. This is going to be where we are, downtown Winston, uh-huh. is going to be part of High Point, Greensboro. So it's going to be a more compact six district, and that's you know contested right now. Uh, that was Mark Walker's district, and now uh, it's going to shift more to a Democrat district. So we'll see uh, what happens this November. Do you like do you like being the congressman? Uh, I, I love the honor of serving. You know, mm-hmm. people say, like, do you like being sheriff? Well, you have tough days. Yeah, I had one today and the day before, the day before. I can't have it. I can't yeah. remember an easy day, but yeah, but go ahead. That's a whole. <laughs> we can what spend did the Navy SEAL say? Yeah. Uh, only easy day was yesterday. Yesterday, that's it. <laughs> that was yesterday. That was my easy yeah. day yesterday. Yeah, I, look, I don't want to take away anything from law enforcement or for those who serve uh, in uniform, but, you know, it's tough, but in a different way. Um, I love, love, love the privilege of it. The people that I've met, I imagine the people that you've met. Now, you got to deal with some tough characters in law enforcement. 
and it's different for us. I mean, but we we meet people in Washington that are just passing through, uh, you know, all the way from uh, the president, the Senate, all the way down. And, and I don't want to put it on an up down perspective, but just constituents that come through with great stories, tough stories, people we try to help. So you know, kind of coming from a background of service, it's a real honor to be able to help people. I've got like this morning, somebody calls. Father-in-law passes away in Guatemala, mm. and now Guatemala is locked down because of COVID. That's right. And they can't, you know, this this has happened twice in the last week. People can't go and see, um, uh, you know, deathbed situations where they want to be at the bedside caring for loved ones, but they can't if it's in another country. So we'll work with the State Department on their behalf, you know, to get an exception, set up some uh, uh, some criteria where they can go see family. Not always successful. But, I mean, that's the stuff that doesn't make the news. But we love, love helping people. So let me ask you a question. You know, I have to ask you this one, even though you and I know each other uh, and we've traveled in different circles, just missing each other in the circles we've been traveling in. Looking at what's happening in the country today, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, which part? Because we got so many things going on. Yeah, so, I mean, so, yeah. so right now the thing is this big social divide, the, mm-hmm. the protesting, the the social disorder, I mean, from uh, everything from social unrest, um, how do we how do we fix or how do we bridge the gap that's taking place? How do we, from your perspective, do we close that? Yeah, that's a huge question. That's kind of the question right now. It is. So I want to maybe break it down a little bit. Maybe you can help me with this some. Um, look at, like, we operate in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, And I'm on the Financial Services Committee. So um, my chairwoman is Maxine Waters. You know, been there a long time, very successful in her own right. When I'm in the elevator with chairwoman Maxine Waters, we get along. We disagree on policy. We disagree on direction. But we're courteous to each other. And uh, That's important. It is. It is. And so I think... In these moments of interaction, whether it's in the store or a grocery store line, you see a lot of Americans getting along when, you know, somebody wants to pull up next to me at a stoplight and they may not even, you know, recognize this elected role that I'm in and they want to talk. It's a person that looks different than me. Mm-hmm. We're going to be courteous. How you doing? Yeah. We're going to ask those kind of questions. People need to know that they're loved, that they're accepted for who they are. we got to figure out how to deal with I don't, I don't even call it racism. I think it's bigger than that. I think I call it, it's a word I've used. It's called differentism. we got to figure out how to deal with people that are different than us. And look, for me, um, uh, for me, it's Christianity mm. and the golden rule that comes from that. It's my faith that calls me to love people that are different than me. So I would point people to their creator and realize like that. that their creator loves them and we're created and we're called to love like he like horizontally or vertically, mm. he loves us from above. And I think he calls us to love horizontally our neighbor. And so I think if we remember that and approach it with humility, that helps. Um, I like I like that, that that analogy that you gave, that analogy. He loves us from a vertical, therefore we have to love horizontally and spread that love. I like that. That's a good touch to that. Now, you now know, to live it out in, you know, every day. Exactly. In these moments of stress and tension. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, but what I was going to share earlier. In the elevator, we get along, but mm-hmm. let's talk about the media where we're hearing about these divides. Yeah, it's, it's real. First of all, I don't want to take anything away from the tensions now, um, but there's so much going on. And when you think about you and I growing up, right, mm-hmm. uh, we had the, the the journal and the sentinel, right? Remember the remember yeah. the evening paper that yeah, would come out? Yeah. yeah, you get yeah. the journal in the morning and the sentinel, sentinel in the night. evening. Right. And uh, then we maybe had three, we had channel two, channel eight, channel 12, and if you had that funny looking antenna on the back, right. channels 45 and 48. 40, right. Right. 45 and that's all we had. But now, I mean, how much can we get to on the internet? Oh. How many, how many magazines, how many news sources, how many, Massive. you know, Twitter feeds? It's infinite. Yeah. It's infinite. And for those that are driven by advertising, they got to get just as many eyeballs as the Journal and Sentinel and whatever, you know, CBS and NBC and ABC did back in the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. So they've got to be more extreme. Now, if you've ever seen a train wreck or a car wreck, you can't turn away from it, or a building fire. You can't turn away from it. It's what we're wired to look at. So, so the more intense it gets, 
the more it tries to draw us in. And it can also have the effect of making us believe that that's all of reality. Now, look, when you look at Portland, when you look at Seattle, when you look at uh, Minneapolis, yeah, that's, that's for real. But that's not all of reality. I think still in America today, there are more people out there now getting along than aren't getting along. We got real problems. I don't want to take away from that. We need to address them. But I think we need to be grateful for some of the good things that are actually going on. You know, I, I, I respect that. I hear that. So when I look out at the world today in <clears throat> my 59 years of living, I have never seen this divide before as much as I see now. I have not. Uh, it frightens me um, because every day it seems like the divide gets wider. And so my mission every day is how do I be an agent of closing that gap? How do I bring people together? Um, we've had racism from the time I've been living. I'm sure to be here after I'm gone. Um, and I love the analogy about you and uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Walters is how you're respectful. And I think that where we run into problems that when we become disrespectful to one another, when we forget that love that you spoke about, when we forget that we in this together, when we forget that what happens to you or what happens to someone else, uh, that direct and indirect effect. And, and I think that at some point in time, we have to be able to sit across from one another like you and I are doing and discuss our differences and how do we come together to make us the intent of what we talk about being all the time. And every day I look and I, I try to figure out and I say to myself, what can I do to be a change agent? What can I do? Um, today I stood before a group of people and um, I apologized for the actions of something that had happened. And I think that sometimes in life we have to go back to tables or go back to places and say, you know what, I apologize uh, Congressman Bud, for what I said, and that's where the magic starts to take place at, where we start engaging in dialogue, we start talking to one another. And I, I love the philosophy that you have. It That means a lot. That showed me another side of you that I did not know when you spoke about the love. We've got to have that. In spite of our differences, I've still got to have a certain amount of respect and love for you. And I think that right there will change the trajectory that we're on. And I'm frightened about it because I see the uptick in violence that we're having uh, in our communities. Uh, I see the number of uh, just downright harshness that we speak to one another, the climate. And so um, as a congressman, I want you to know that regardless of what people party affiliations are, I, 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 I think that we cannot become so engulfed or entrenched in politics and all those isms and adjectives that we lose sight of what's the truth and the value of one another. Hmm. And so some of the things that you said to me, uh, I appreciate that. that. That showed me a different side. You know, I had respect for it, but what you said when we was talking offline, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You know, these these jobs that you have and I have, people could, well, on their face, you could say, well, that's a, there's a lot of pride in that job. <laughs> but it also takes a lot of humility to do what you do every day, to go out there and say, you know, you're sorry when you actually are. And then me, hey, I didn't get this one right. Um, you know, I, I ask God to protect my words every day um, because they matter. They do. Uh, in my actions, but I think um, to do these jobs rightly, uh, it actually requires humility more than it does, you know, pride or ambition. Let me ask you a question. You know, I always ask people this when I talk to them, uh, people I feel comfortable asking this, and I feel comfortable asking you, what was the defining moment in your life? So I'll tell you mine um, since I give you a chance to kind of think about 
the defining moment in my life came in 2005. That changed me forever. Um, you know, most people that have seen the podcast or know me, that was the year that I uh, lost my wife, the, the year she passed. That was the year that I met humility. That was the year that I met uh, have not. That was the year that uh, I learned the meaning of the dollar menu. And um, that was a very humbling time in my life, but yet defining. It was a defining moment in my life. And at that moment of my life, I decided that the birth date didn't matter what year I was born, the exit date didn't matter. What mattered at that point was how would I live from this point on living between the hyphen. And that moment was a very defining moment in who Bobby is today. And so I ask people all the time, what was the defining moment in your life that shaped you to made you realize some things that you had not realized prior to the defining moment? You know, it sounds like, and thinking back, a defining moment is often a moment of trauma. Exactly. And then how we process it. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the, the big things we're dealing with now is unprocessed trauma. And how do we do with something that, how do we deal with something that did or didn't happen to us that, you know, something that didn't happen that should have, I would look at mine as more of a chain of events. Okay. You know? One of them is kind of where I grew up on a farm, uh, growing up there and, and then going into school in Winston, you know, you're, you're kind of in living in two worlds. So I think that structure, while it was really good for the long haul, it's awkward because you're not really one of the cool kids when you're. You know, when you're when you're going to school in Winston as a young kid and then you're uh, you're on a farm, you're one of the farm kids. And so you're not really accepted in either world, but you learn to get along with a broader range of people, urban, rural. Yeah. Uh, so I think that was a defining structure, you know, a car accident as a, as a first grader turning uh, at six year old, six years old, uh, turning seven in the hospital and then. You know, you're just starting to go to PE around that time and, you know, learn sports. And then to be behind the curve because you're in traction for, you know, and body cast for you know, a couple of months. So I think not being that early life athlete and having lived, you know, kind of that farm city world, kind of figuring out where you belong, I think that was, that was probably it. And realizing you got you to gotta carve a path for yourself and really, really, really trusting God. Yeah. For those things. So so let me ask you a question. Yeah. Based on where you sit in D.C. and as a congressman, do you believe that this is another defining moment in the history of America? In the history of America or in, like, my life as I'm involved no, here? The his, no, 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 the history of America. Oh, and yeah. I say that probably the history of the world, if we took in consideration the pandemic. Um, the reason I asked the question was, Currently, we have basically two pandemics going on simultaneously is the way I say it. Mm -hmm. We have COVID-19, which has basically challenged and rearranged our whole way of doing business here in the U.S. As a result of COVID-19, it has challenged our medical systems. It has challenged so many of our systems, even our education systems. Mm -hmm. You know, we won't be going to school on time, basketball. It's changed so much about how we do business in America. And then here we are with this social unrest that we see happening all over the country now mm -hmm. uh, from various movements. And so when I sit sometimes in the evenings before I leave here at 7, 30, 8 o'clock at night, and I sit and I watch the world news and I flip through the television and I listen to some of the, uh, the, the, the broadcasts and I just surf the net just, and I see a change. I see so many things changing and happening right before our eyes. And so mm -hmm. I often say to myself, and I say to a lot of people I know that this too is another defining, we've had several defining moments mm -hmm. in American mm -hmm. history. And I think that this right here will be another um, defining moment in American history. It will change how we do business. It'll change policies and procedures. It'll change how we deal and interact with one another. I think, you know, we're, what we're seeing in 2020, and a lot of people are ready for 2021. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, I believe they are. I'm sure they are. Yeah. 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 I'm somebody, sure they are. If somebody said, hey, God, you know, you promised you'd never send a flood, but I promise you it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you yeah. Can, you could do it. But, 
you know, all that, all that aside, you know, it's a tough year. I, I like your analogy of two different pandemics, uh, one of them social, one of them physical medical. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, some people have But you have know looked, what, though? Not to cut you off. Yeah. They both are contagious and they both are lethal. Even the social. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, some people have said, and I've just finished two books. One of them's called The Storm Before the Calm. Actually, The Storm Before the Calm. Mm -hmm. Right? It says, it's George Friedman. He's talking about we're in a storm now. It's, it's a predictable social cycle of 80 years, and we're in it in 2020. You know, last was 1940. Think about what the chaos was going on in the world between Germany, the U.S., Japan, 1941. Right. Prior to that, 1860. Prior to that, you know, that was the American Revolution. Right. And the French Revolution. So we're in these, they're in these cycles. That's one, and Peter Zion is another author that, Disunited Nation, who's kind of talking about this as part of a larger cycle. You know, we started January thinking this was, you know, a great year, another decade ahead, but... Who knew what we were going to face when we were in January? And we started to see some early signs in, in Congress, um, you know, when we were looking at some diseases happening in China and the contagion, and we started calling for the travel ban. But this is all much bigger than that. Yeah, this will be a societally changing year. Um, it won't go, people say, I want, the, I want to go back to normal. Well, it's not going to be normal. Uh, but there will be, it won't be like this forever. The new abnormal, huh? <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it. A, it's going to be a. It's going to be a new normal. Some things will feel. You know, you'll see some sports again. You're going to see a lot of things uh, again that look like normal. But you know, there's. It's going to be in our uh, collective memory of what's happened this year. So, what do you see? What do you see? If you had the crystal ball, and not even a crystal ball, just based on what you know, because you privileged information that everybody's not privileged to. Yeah, don't overestimate it, though. <laughs> People think you have privileged yeah. information, too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe so you, you do. So, so, so you privileged the information that uh, the ordinary citizen don't get a chance to see. Uh, you see things that the ordinary citizen don't get a chance to see. Based on your vision, based on what you see, tell me what you see in a year or two from now. I want Tell me what you see in terms of economic, social, and political. Tell me what you see. Boy, that's a great question. And I would say, first of all, don't overestimate the the privilege of the information I get. Yeah, I get some secure briefings, but within two or three days, it's public information. So I might get it. Not all I, of it, though. And, I, you know, and we get a huge volume of information. I mean, that's really, it, it is drinking out of the fire hose. We, oh, we kind of laugh at yeah. that because we, I mean, all of a sudden we'll be working on trying to help somebody through customs in right. Guatemala and now we're dealing with COVID-19 and now we're dealing with a you know a cyber threat from right. China so it's all that within a matter of hours so it get, you get whipsawed back and forth um, I think of uh, I don't know if this is the analogy but I think of uh, an early family business before I was born 1968 and uh, worried about the warehouse burning down on Liberty Street because of social unrest and you know that was that was a season but it wasn't forever you know into the 70s and beyond it became more peaceful so i don't think this is sustainable america will continue what it looks like a lot of it's going to depend on november and what happens and you know i really wish look i'm a republican you're a democrat um how do you know that <laughs> <laughs> hey i got wikipedia too right yeah you would <laughs> go ahead yeah um but a lot of it's going to depend on the election. I really wish people uh, could know the president that I knew. I really do. And, man, he doesn't say things like I would say him. He doesn't say things like this first part of this podcast like I would. Um, but I see a guy who loves people, and sometimes the way he says things, it, it's not like we say him here in Winston-Salem. But uh, he's a tough New Yorker. He's been a, uh, basically a, a business street fighter all of his life. You know, and I just think that he just cares for the people around him, and I wish that could get translated to a person to person. You know, we have a saying that we say around here. If you come in the front door, you'll see it. It says, "We don't do what's black, what's white, what's uh, Republican, or Democrat, independent. We always do what is right." When we make decisions around here, we move politics from it. Mm -hmm. We remove race from it. I just believe that in leadership. I can't make decisions based on my political affiliation. 
as the sheriff because there are people that live in this county that are Republican, Democrats, independent, black, white, Latino, Hispanic, the list goes on. So that was one of the first posters, pictures that we put up. We do what is right. Um, and you know, it's interesting that you said what my affiliation is. When I hire people, I don't even know what the people that work here are. When I came into this office, um, we didn't fire no one. Um, the guy that we left, who was the chief deputy, registered Republican. That I didn't care what he was. All I care about is that you get the job done. I don't care about those adjectives. I don't. I believe, it's just my personal opinion, I believe that when you start moving like that, you lose your integrity from the Latin word intrica. You can't be divided. Mm. Your leadership cannot be divided. And so when I move like that, my decisions are based on what's around me. I've never met the man that's in the office. I hadn't. Uh, never met him. Uh, uh, but all of us. Can, can I tell you a quick story? Sure. And this was this was shared to me before I was sworn into office. And as a man who has lost a loved one, you know, in 05, you might appreciate this. And that is um, uh, when you win in November, right before Thanksgiving, they send you up to Harvard as and it's bipartisan and it's to the JF, JFK School of uh, Institute of Politics. And, mm-hmm. They just give you the basics, and it's, you know, you're sitting there with the Democrats who won. There was a class of 50 when we went in, and I noticed um, um, standing next to me, you know, there's an NFL team owner. He's coming in the door. I'm kind of sitting in one of the tables near the door. He comes in, and and I'm talking to him. He says, what do you, I said, he says, what do you guys want to talk about? Because he's, he's going to be our next kind of a surprise speaker. This guy's worth $5 billion at the time. I said, hey, we're all getting ready to build teams here. So tell us about be, building teams. And so he gets up there, he does, and he says, look, he says, I know this is a bipartisan group. And I said, I know some of you all are un- very uncomfortable with who's getting ready to be your president in a few weeks or a few months. He says, but let me tell you, I lost my wife five years ago to cancer. And he says, and the president and Melania came and stood with me at the funeral. And he says, and every week for a year, he called me to check on me just to see how I was doing. He says, I don't know what your politics are, as he pointed at all of us. He says, but I can tell you that's the kind of man you got as president. Well, you know, we invite everybody to table. We, when we set people at the table, we don't care about all of their politics. We care about what are they doing for the community, what are they doing for this city, this county, this state, and this mm-hmm. country. Um, when you see him, tell him he's welcome to come by. You know, we'd love to have him as a guest, have him bring secret service with him. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we talk to everybody, anybody, you know. Uh, we believe that at the end of the day, we must be able to have conversation. Yeah. We must be able to have uh, communication. We must be able to move together. We're greater together than we ever be apart. And that's just the mantra in which we built this on and, and how we move here at the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office. And so uh, I want to thank you for coming today, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate uh, all that you're doing. Uh, when you talk to Ken, tell him I said hello. I want to give you the last word before I take us home. Well, Sheriff, um, you know I deal with uh, five different sheriffs, and I I'm, I'm from Winston. I'm from Winston. You're my sixth. But I thought he was, but, I was but here's girl. why: because I don't represent Forsyth County. I'm born here. I shop here. I go to church here. And but the way the districts are drawn, it goes all around it. So I'm your favorite. You can you, say that's right. You that's can, right. You, you can that's say right. that. That's right. Okay, you're my favorite. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. We got. And that. I want to give you what I do want to give you is my very first challenge coin. I appreciate that. And that, that is something that law enforcement officers and you can explain that how they exchange yeah. that among the departments. And some of us in Congress have these, but I have not uh, given these to any other law enforcement officers yet because they have just come in. But I want to share this with you. That. As my very first Thank you. challenge coin appreciate given to a law enforcement officer. And Thank I'm grateful you very much. for the good work that you do. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. That means something. Thank you very much. Well, I want you to know that I appreciate you. Uh, stop by any time. I do mean that our doors swing on welcome hinges. We welcome everybody. I, I just love the dialogue. I think that people should get a chance to talk, meet, and see who represents us. And... Remove a lot of the 
adjectives away and let's just get right down to trying to be better leaders. How do we how do we move the needle forward and help people? So as always, I want to thank you for coming by. I want to thank you for watching. This is Bobby Kimmer with Off the Cuffs. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. 